Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the fourth lecture uh, of the uh, this lecture series under the business mathematics and statistics. I hope uh, you have a bit of an understanding of what we have completed now. So in case uh, if you have just forgotten, let me just give you a brief overview before we start today's lecture as to what we have completed so far and where we are heading. Uh, so we discussed that uh, we are planning to cover 11 earmarked subject areas under the curriculum of business mathematics and statistics. So as a part and parcel of the very beginning two sessions we have covered uh, in, in the past three lectures are giving you a stepping stone onto how you are going to apply your knowledge on the basics in the advanced computational statistics which you will be learning in the upcoming uh, lecture series. So the very first lecture we, which we have covered the absolute basics of statistics onto a few definitions and uh, things on data information, things on qualitative and quantitative data, uh, how we can gather data, so on and so forth. And on the second lecture we discussed extensively on the uh, categorization or the representation of the gathered data. Broadly, we call that sampling, if you could remember. So under the sampling also, we discussed two main branches, uh, probabilistic and non-probabilistics, and then where we have recognized uh, multiple methods of uh, preparing samples from the gathered data from a larger population. Why we need to do the sampling? It's merely because that we might not have the luxury to go and uh, entangled with all the data points in the population due to various given reasons. Uh, in the third lecture, we discussed uh, very briefly on how to present those uh, gathered data in a concise manner. Now, if you could recall that, let's say we have an array of 10,000 of data uh, where you might find it a bit uncomfortable to write in a piece of paper or even using Excel, where you might uh, it might not be really eye appealing or uh, you, you might not be able to eyeball and identify most important uh, measures. Isn't that so? So instead, we uh, recognize that it's very important to uh, categorize and present the data in a concise manner. The absolute basic tool which we used uh, for the categorization is nothing but the basics we know already. Those are charting and graphing. So the tabulated data you could represent in a multiple way. You could draw bar charts, you could uh, like try different types of bar charts in the instances where you need to represent data like uh, simple, multiple, component, percentage component. And there are many more other uh, ch charts and graphs also that you can use. Those are like uh, pie charts, uh, line charts, we merely limited our discussion in the interest of the timing for charts, sorry, the bar charts and the pie charts. So that's that's been the most frequent tested areas also in the examination. So having having given a very brief introduction as to what we have completed so far, uh, students, now we are heading to the more interesting sessions of the discussion that will be on the computational aspects. I, I implore that uh, in the past couple of lectures also I uh, highlighted that what we are covering so far doesn't really give you much insight into uh, the bigger questions, bigger 20 mark questions. But from now, from this point onwards, we are looking at uh, completing uh, a broader range of 20 mark questions uh, in the areas of statistics. The section that we are about to cover today, the title is given as numerical descriptive measures which will cover the central tendency and dispersion. We'll be running to, uh, through two lectures as today and the week after. Uh, at the next, uh, at the end of the next uh, week, we'll be able to answer comfortably some 20 mark questions, which will be very important uh, for you to uh, get a uh, amicably good score at the examination. Because when you realize that uh, the patterns of the equations that has been tested in the examination, you might really 
find it very comfortable if you could uh, try out maybe three or four examination questions. And after the session three being finished, then we are moving to probability. Probability is also another complete uh, 20 mark uh, question where you can comfortably uh, derive certain equations from base, basic theory, conditional probability, base uh, equation, few more things to be learned, and then easily score another 20 mark question if you choose to select the uh, question on probability. But be mindful again, these are areas that examiners are very keen to test your knowledge on a complete 20 mark question. So provided you have a very solid understanding on the questions being tested in question number one, which is a compulsory, and then uh, also at the last question, if you could recall, question number eight, where you will be asked to do a lot of comparison, uh, compare and contrast sometimes, sometimes give some descriptive uh, elaborations. With that question and question number one, alongside with these couple of more questions in uh, areas that we are about to start from today onwards will alleviate you to a comfortable position on writing the examination questions easily. So I recall that facing the examination is only one aspect, but our main target of this lecture series is to drive knowledge where you could use these uh, stepping stones to the higher subjects in the other subject areas in the next level as well as your uh, upcoming studies. So that uh, gives you a brief introduction as to what we have completed so far and where we are heading. Having said that, we'll start today's lecture on uh, numerical descriptive measures where we are focusing on central tendency and dispersion extensively. Uh, I need to mention uh, at the beginning of the lecture, I have added three more slides to the uh, lecture slides that we are discussing just to give you more data or uh, some classroom examples. So while we are covering this uh, lecture slides, let me switch back to the amended slides where you will be easily identifying what are the amendments that have made. Okay. So this is the contents of the day. We'll be going through a very basic introduction into what is descriptive statistics first. Then we will be looking at the word central tendency of a given data set as to identify what you mean by that and what are the measures of central tendency in the section number three. Section number four and five are the second part of today's lecture where we'll be discussing measures on dispersion. So central tendency as the word suggesting, if you have to break down today's lecture into a nutshell, uh, I'm uh, talking on point number two and three in the contents page here he is merely trying to represent the given data set by means of one or two measures of central biasness or tendency or probability which a data point is uh, moving towards the center point of the data set. Why we do that we'll be discussing at the lecture and section number four and five is the opposite of this where given a central tendency, we need to identify a given data point, how dispersed it can be from the central points that we are uh, discussing under section two and three. That's about today's lecture. I repeat, central tendency and dispersion is going to be the discussion today, okay? Right. Let's start today's session by very basic definition of descriptive statistics. Look at the next slide. Descriptive statistics involving data collection, organization, presenting, and analysis. So we, we have so far gathered, uh, gathered knowledge on data collection, organizing by means of sampling, presenting by means of charting, and we are coming to the fourth point of the basic branches of statistics, that is analyzing. For you to do a detailed analysis, it's very important to cluster the data into groups and then present them in a way by means of statistical indicators for your audience to get an understanding. It can be used to explain a sample data set by means of graphically or numerically in a concise manner. That's what we discussed. Explaining the complete data set using a sample is called inferential statistics. That's the 
opposite of descriptive statistics where you are looking at the complete data set or the sigma or the population. Rather, in descriptive statistics, merely uh, as the lecture passed by, you will understand that we are more or less focusing on the sample by uh, with our broader assumption that we might not have the luxury to entangle all the data points in the population most of the time. We come to the point on central tendency in this slide. Now, central tendency is the characteristics of data being biased towards one given data point, more or less a one central or one middle point. It might not be the middle point always, maybe given one point. It describes the spread of data of a given variable. Let's say a variable of uh, 50 students in a given class, and I'm interested in their weights, W-E-I-G-T-S, weights. So what I want to do is to get an understanding of the students' weight, how heavy they are, okay? Let's say I'm planning to put up some new chairs, and then I need to do an estimate of the uh, endurance of the chairs. Let's say I'm going for a cost-effective chair. Still, I want to get an understanding of how much of a weight can be borne by a chair. For that study to be done, I am looking at analyzing the weight pattern of the students. In that sense, in that given spread of data set, you might need to come to a conclusion. Uh, let's say um, a given student weights 120 kilograms, and there's another student who weights just 35 kilograms. Okay. Now, those two ends, I might be not interested in. Why? Uh, this, my example says that I want to uh, design a chair or other, you know, um, make a decision on a chair to be purchased for the classroom, which should support the majority of the students. But in that case, what do you think that I might be interested in taking the lowest value or the maximum value? How about a value like average? So now that is where you need to understand that the entire data set could be represented by one given variable of central tendency that we are going to select. So that is why it said it describes the spread of a data of a given variable. Now when you're using the central tendency measures, you need to understand that you are going to represent a data set by means of one value or give an idea to your audience about a given data set by using one measure. So it's very important to define it clearly without any errors. Otherwise, it can, uh, I mean, it could lead to misrepresentation. So following measures are used to measure the central tendency. Now, this is what I've been keep telling about uh, where the examiner are very keen to test your fundamental knowledge on these three areas. We are going to discuss the three central tendency measures of mode, median, and mean under the uh, area that we are about to cover. In broad, mode means the highest frequency of occurrence in a given data set. In my 50 students example, let's say uh, around 30 students are coming close to 45 kilograms. That's the mode. Why? I'm talking about 50. From a total of 50, approximately 30 is coming to a closer value of 45 kilograms. That gives me an understanding, okay, that must be the highest mm, occurrence in my given data set. Median, on the other hand, is the middle point of the center, the data set that we are going to discuss. When you arrange it in a uh, particular manner, you might it could be ascending or descending, it doesn't really matter. When you arrange it in a particular matter, you will understand the middle point represent the median point. Last but not least, and the most important measure but we'll be carrying throughout this uh, lecture series with the mean. Mean is the average. Or uh, in some cases, you might find that uh, the means will have different names. Arithmetic means, weighted average, uh, 
mean for open uh, ended classes, mean for closed ended classes, mean for discrete, discrete variables, continuous variables. So I would broadly define mean as average, which, which will have the representation of the entire data set by mean of an uh, average point. So the mean that we are going to discuss under today's lecture series will um, uh, statistically we could call it as the arithmetic mean. Okay. So let's look into one uh, one by one these measures, uh, their users, advantages, disadvantages. Uh, I put an important note here. You need to understand some of these advantages and disadvantages, the limitations, why you will understand when we're discussing the examination questions. Having said that, let's take the first one. Mode. This is the most frequent scope or value of a given data set. You may find single mode, dual mode, multiple mode, or no mode instances of a data set. Let's look at some of the examples. Okay, I'm um, going to use the. Let's say I'm going to write a data set of five, six, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, okay. Now in this given data set, you could identify that mode should be the highest frequency of occurrence in a uh, in the considered data set. You could easily identify that we have two six values here. So you could write the mode of this data series as six. Let's look at this series. This is the first one. So in this given data set, what do you think of the mode? You will see two eight values here, two seven values here, I'm sorry, and two eight values here. So this is an example of having two modes or dual modes. You can name it appropriately. Last example I want to discuss will have values like this. One, two, three, four, and six. What is the mode? There is no mode in this given data set because every uh, occurrence in this given data set has a similar frequency. Let's say you have two ones, two twos, two threes, two fours, and uh, the data set goes up to 12 values. Still, the frequency will be same, equal. It doesn't have to be one of a base. So these are some of the examples where you will find mode could be identified easily. But what do you think in practical scenarios? Do you think the mode is really easily identified for a, a frequency of, uh, let's say, 10,000 observations? That is where you need to have the computational tools like Microsoft Excel or MATLAB or any other advanced tool, where you can key those data and easily identify the uh, mode, median, and mean, so on and so forth. These are some of the characteristics of the mode. Mode is not affected by extreme values. It's very important. This point is very important. Mode is not affected by extreme values. I'll come to another example. Let's look at the second one. Mode can be calculated for a data set with open class intervals also. Let's keep that aside also for a minute. Third one. It is a measure which can be also derived by using graphs graphical methods. Last point, a good measure to explain average values of a data set in a qualitative manner. Now these points, uh, I again reiterate, now these points has been uh, some of the pet areas of the examiners throughout the past couple of years to test your knowledge on. Let's take one, one by one. first point I'm going to discuss, that is, mode is not affected by extreme values. Let's look at a data set like this. Okay. Um, five, six, seven, seven, seven. Okay. And then I'm looking at eight. Can of eight hundred. Well, what is this eight hundred? 
oh, let's say I'm going to add another value, 0 0.00001. There's another value here, four zeros and a one, and 800. In this given data set, what is the mode? Still, we don't really have to care about these values because their frequency is one, 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 and one. However, we see three sevens here. So we could easily identify that seven is the mode of the given data set. But when you are discussing on the other measures like uh, mean, you might identify that these values are extremely going to tarnish the quality of the other data set, which is ranging in a very narrow bandwidth. Why? Uh, if you look at the numbers, these are ranging from five to eight. We have six numbers here. However, the seventh number is an extreme large number. When you take an average, you will identify that the average will lie towards the 800. So these are extreme values, extreme large and extreme small. Still, mode will not get affected by the extreme values. And also the second point we discussed, that is mode can be calculated for a data set with open class intervals also, which you might not really find some of the questions being tested here. But what it says is, if you have uh, modes for, let's say, class intervals of 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, let's say 40 onwards here and 10 below here. Still, when you look at the frequency of occurrences of each of these classes, you could, unlike the other measures like uh, median, uh, sorry, uh, measures like uh, mean, you can still look at the pattern of data which will be appearing here and easily identify a mode value. Third point, it is a measure which can also be derived by using graphs. That we discussed some couple of weeks ago. Sorry, the last week. Let's say this is the frequency. This is the occurrence of different values. Let's say um, we have five here, we have 50 here, we have another bar of 500 here. So, so, so simply, this is the maximum number of occurrences or the frequency of a given uh, frequency distribution. So graphically, you could easily identify that uh, the given variables will have a mode of 500. About the second point, mode can be calculated for a data set which open class intervals. I reiterate that. Let's say some of these open cl the, the classes or the groups that we are going to discuss under the statistics are merely not being question heavy. Rather, you could have an understanding on what they are and how you can derive certain uh, indicators in, in a given instance like this. Say some now this is where you could cluster data into different classes. Let's say from given 10 and 20, you have five data points. 20 to 30, you have uh, 10. 30 to 40, you have two. And less than 10, you have only one. And more than 40, or also let's say three for discussion purposes. You could identify that in the second point, what we're discussing here, mode can be calculated for a data set with open class intervals also. Still, you could identify that mode will be a value that will stemming around 20 to 30. Now similar to our uh, cases like 5 and 7, now this value will be the x variable or the variable that I'm going to discuss. So let's say in this example, let's say you have 10 here and 30 here, in that case you could say the mode belongs to the class of 40 or above. But can, uh, do you think that you can easily identify a mean value here? You might not really comfortably find here because when you say open class intervals of let's say less than one or more than 40, you don't know where this ends. Isn't that so? So you, you might not really find a value or an average value in cases like open class intervals. Rather, still by looking at the class and the distribution of the nature, 
you might identify the mode. That's what's explaining point number two. Lastly, it says it's a good measure to explain average values of a data set in a qualitative manner also. Let's say instead of given data of numbers, We have a quantitative data set. Let's say three triangles, two squares, and a circle. Still, you could see three standards will be the mode in this given data set, or colors, or you know, consumer preferences, or any other qualitative variable. Still, you could do a count and calculate mode. So now these will be pretty handy when you are discussing. Uh, Questionnaire, questionnaire results, uh, summary of the questionnaire. You might not really find numerical answers, isn't that so? You might find qualitative answers. So for them also, mode could be a uh, easily explainable variable which you can define the central tendency. Okay. Now mode seems to be a simple lesson, but let's be careful again. The theories that we are discussing under the mode is being extensively tested by the examiners, especially in the category of multiple choice questions in the uh, question number one. We're moving on to the second measure of central tendency, which is the median. As we discussed in the beginning also, this is the value which will come to the middle point, 50% point. When we arrange the given data set, or a frequency distribution in an ascending manner. Could you arrange them in a descending manner and get the median? Still you can. I mean, you can look at from minimum to the maximum or maximum to minimum. That doesn't really matter, okay? But the important point is it should come to the middle point. Let's look at some of the characteristics of the mean also. It's a unique measure which can be demarcated always. Second point, no influence from skewed or outlier values. We'll discuss them one by one. Third point, the ability of computing when all the observations of a data set are not known in distribution with open class intervals, similar to what we discussed before, being a good measure of a central tendency for extremely skewed distributions. Now, what these characteristics are? The first one, the unique measure which can be demarcated always. Now, when you look at the median of a particular data set, um, I mean, in the, in the first place, you might get a question like, okay, why do we really need to look at the central point? Uh, what does it say? I mean, it, it's just a number, right? You have the least value, then the maximum value, and in statistical jargon like quartiles, you could dist uh, distinguish the 25th point and the 75th point to identify which uh, which quarter of the data is belong to quartiles. But what is the advantage of the median? Median is where you could easily identify the middle point where your data is lying. Now, let's say you want to, uh, in our class example of 50 students, you want to identify that when you uh, put them in an array, in an ascending order like this, which point will come to the middle. But then again, the middle point really says, okay, the 50% of the data points that we are going to discuss will be below that point. And on the other hand, the other 50% of the data points that we are going to discuss is greater than the discussed median. So that is why it, why it says it's a unique measure which can be demarcated always. But we need to understand that sometimes, depending on the odd and even numbers of an even distribution, sometimes you might not really find one value for median. In that case, what we have to do. Let's say now this given data set up. Now I'm going to arrange it for the discussion purposes. Okay. One, two, three, four, and five. Pretty easy, straightforward. This seems to be the middle value. But what if I add one more number? Now, if you look at the middle point, there is no exact number to 
represent the median. So that's all. in here in this first data set. You easily identify, okay, there's a number, numerical value of three lying in the middle position. So you have 50% of data from uh, below from this point, 50% of the data above from that point. So the count. But in this case, there is no numerical value representing this middle position. What do we have to do? We have to merely take the middle point of these two values to represent the median. So there is an important characteristic that we have to identify in the median. Now in the mode, now let's say an example of mode being discussed again. You have five, six, seven, seven, and seven, and eight. Now this number seven is an actual number which is lying in the data set. However, in cases like median, you might sometimes find a value Sometimes you may have to derive the middle point using the two points adjoining to the central point. So you have three data points towards this side, three data points towards that side. So you might not really find a number in between, but you have to do take the middle point of the two data points. Having said that, the third point is similar to what we discussed under the mode. When we have open class intervals, still we could calculate a median. Similar to our example of those classes, you could identify the middle class, which let's say the third uh, class or the third frequency uh, set, and identify, okay, the median must be lying to, uh, towards the third one. But if you have a uh, similar to example of, let's say six or eight uh, class intervals, you could forget the open class intervals. You could forget the higher, so maximums or minimums, but still come to the middle point of third and fourth and take the average of those two frequency occurrences to derive the median. Lastly, it says it's a good measure of central tendency for extremely skewed distributions. Now the word skewed will be discussing, uh, part of it will be discussed on the next lecture and the following lectures on the probability. Uh, the idea of skewness is a data set now for the qualitative manner we'll just discuss the uh, idea of being uh, skewed if a data set is distributed nicely and equally towards one central point in statistics and mathematics we could identify that as a normal distribution where the data is equally distributed 50 50 from a central point however sometimes uh, it might not be the case always in practical scenarios for example, let's say advanced level uh, marks of uh, chemistry uh, for the mathematics students, it will lie in a pattern of a skewed distribution. Uh, the marks will actually, if you look at the uh, data published by the Department of Examination, you might sometimes find the average value will come close towards the lower side. Uh, so what's the range of those marks? It can be, theoretically, it can be zero to 100 but put the middle point it would be 50. However the average and the uh, means and the medians will be coming towards the uh, zero uh, let's say 30 or 35 unlike it focus on the 50. So once you look at the uh, characteristics of mean median and mode in the uh, next lecture you will identify that uh, by merely looking at the values of the means medians and modes numerical numbers without looking at a data set you could recognize okay whether it's a uh, centrally distributed data set or a positive biased data set or a negatively biased data set that is what we meant by point number four here being a good measure of central tendency for extremely skewed distribution okay so having discussed these two points we will come to the most popular point we are going to discuss throughout the next couple of slides that is the mean or the arithmetic mean to be precise. This is the value derived by dividing the sum of all observations of a data set from the 
number of data points in it. I repeat, it's nothing but the sum of all observations. Uh, mathematical summation of a data set divided from the number of data points in it. Let's say we have 10 data points. Uh, calculate the arithmetical total of those data points, divide by 10 will give you the mean. When each observation of a population contains capital N number of data denoted by simple variables of x1, x2, x3 towards xn, the mean of the population can be derived by uh, there's a small, uh, let me just quickly shift towards my original slide set. Yeah, now this is the equation, the correct equation. The mean of the population can be derived as sigma i equals 1 to capital N xi divided by n. Now, since we are touching upon this sigma marks for the first time, let me take a moment and explain what do you mean by that. Before we going to complicate ourselves with this equation of uh, this, uh, sorry, this sigma and i equals 1 to n and this xi, let's just take an example of a simple data set and try to calculate a mean, okay? Let us look at data point of 5, 10, 15, 20 and 25. Would you calculate the mean of this? What you have to do? You have to take the arithmetic total of this, divide by 5. What would be the answer? I tried the calculator, okay. You could try the calculator, I recommend. If you have the calculator always at the examination, uh, don't uh, you know, try to be uh, smart and um, get messed up at the calculation, but easily you could see 15 seems to be the average point. Am I correct? Okay, good. Now, what, what do we do to calculate the mean here? x bar would be simply 5 plus 10 plus 15 plus 20 plus 25 divided by 2, 3, 5 data points which will give you an average of 15. So students if you look at your notes what is being what is being meant by this equation uh, for this uh, sigma i from 1 to n will be denoted by these variables. Now, instead of 5, let's say we have x here. So, since this is the first item, I will call it as x1. This will be like what as x2, x3, x4, x5. So, what we have done here is could be otherwise spelled as x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 plus x5 divided by 5. Isn't that so? So instead of this 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, now I am only discussing on 5 points, so it's very easy, but let's say I have 50 points, then statistically, you could easily use this symbol of sigma to the formation. And you could denote the beginning and the end in these two points. This you will be writing the beginning value, and this will be writing the end value. So since I'm using these variables of, uh, uh, let's say, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is equal to i or l or m or any, any value, here I'm going to denote this by simple i for the discussion purpose, okay? I could write i from 1, that is the first point, towards the last point. Here I know that there are five points, but let's say I'm looking at capital N number of data points, I could write capital N here. So what I'm going to sum here 
is nothing but x i so this is what is represented by this measure of summation if i revert back to the slides again this is what we just discussed we have i equals 1 to capital n we are totaling up x i values so do not worry divided by capital n so i just want to explain the summation part the notation and the standard what we will be using throughout the lecture series okay yeah now don't forget always we have two broader baskets that we are discussing under the topics of statistics the first basket is nothing but population that is an entire data set however from that entire data set always we select samples lecture number two where we discuss different sampling methods so that is where you need to always define the statistical equations into two different aspects one is to the population one is to the sample now in this mean that we are going to discuss here shall have uh, the same equation however when we move on with the lecture series you will identify that certain equations like variation uh, covariance you might have different numerators of uh, data being taken into consideration because of the uh, accuracy or non-biasedness towards the sample when we take a particular data set from an entire population let's say now in, in this class example what we discuss only have five data points let's say you have 50 and you're selecting five and deriving a mean that is where your notation will be slightly changed to what we have discussed under bullet point three here look at that when each observation of simple n number of data given again by x1 x2 up until x simple n look at the difference here here we are discussing x up to capital n 50 here simple n 5 in our example sample mean would be the exact same equation however if you carefully observe you might see that in the population your notation will be simple i equals from 1 to capital n here simple i equals from 1 to simple n so in the in the in the example if you look at the values of population for the entire 50 points you will have to get the summation of their uh, values here divide by 50 in the population but in the sample five points like what we have wrote here divide by pi i hope that's clear okay so in a nutshell if i just recap what we discuss before we forget it mode simply is nothing but the most frequently observed score the value of a given data point data set sorry median is the middle point of a data set when you arrange the data in an orderly manner ascending or descending but for statistical purposes we always refer it as ascending manner mean is nothing but a derived value it might uh, now in mode it was an actual value right median sometimes it could be an actual value sometimes it could be a hypothetical value of two points being divided by two just to denote the exact middle point mean in the most uh, data set if you look at the nature of the distribution of the data mean mean might not be an actual number rather a value which will be giving in the average now in our class example it was just 15 why because i selected intervals from 5 to 5 so easily it could come to 15. however if you look at data points like 3 17 and 31 and 55 and another 57.5 for mean will be uh, let's say hypothetically 32.57 or something like that that was a brief introduction into mean median and mode these are the characteristics of the mean it represents total observations of a data set what do you mean by that now to calculate mean do i have to take only few values and consider few values no. you will have to get the total set of observations in a data set if it's a sample entire data points in the sample entire five data points if it's in the population of 50 the entire 50 data points could be considered to get the mean value 
Second point, ability of using as an algebraic function. That means, uh, now mean, unlike the values of more than, uh, sorry, yeah. No, unlike the values of more than median, you could easily denote mean by, let's say, mu or x bar or any other value which is comfortable and use that in algebraic functions like fx equal to f mean multiplied by 5 likewise. Uh, would that give any advantage uh, to our um, statistical discussion? Of course, why? You could take the representation of entire data set and plug that into an algebraic function. That is what is said by ability of using as an algebraic function. Third, once the means of few data sets, k number of data sets, let's say five data sets for simplicity, are known separately, a single mean can be defined by combining them as follows. That means, let's say you have few data sets of, uh, okay, let's take the board once again. Two data sets in this example is looking at you have five data sets. Okay, like this. I'm going to write number of items or observations or count in this individual data set. 10 here, 7 here, 3 here, 4 and 50 here. And by using these numbers, you have already calculated the mean for this given data set. Okay. Now those means, I will write this as bar, will also have values like 3, 4, 5.7, 6.3, 3 and let's say negative 5. Could a mean have a negative value? Of course, it can have a negative value if the data set is negative numbers. What does this uh, third point say is that when you have a data set like this, for a combined data or for a combined mean, you could easily take a mean by using the equation given like this. What you have to do is simply multiply these numbers. You will have a set of values like this. Get the sigma. Divide by number of items. You have the sigma n here. This total divide by this will give you the value for the entire data set of 50. Otherwise, you might not really want to you know, take all the data set together. So let's say you might have uh, uh, 20 here, 24. You may have 74 data items if you combine this data set together. You may have to take all those 74 points, do a summation and divide by 74 or other. You could again multiply this by number of items by the mean and take the total, divide by 74. That will also give you a exact same answer. Why do you multiply this? Is merely because that 3 represents the entire data set. How do you denote 3? Is by you have 10 numbers here, add them up, divide by 10 will give you 3. So when you multiply that by 3, it will give you the total of the items explained in the data set here. That is what is meant by point number 3. Once in means of few data set k are known separably, you could uh, calculate a single mean also by using an equation. Fourth point, being an identical measure, I would say, unlike values of mode where you have three or four multiple numbers, a mean will always be an identical and a systematically derived number. Okay, that's a qualitative point. Last point, a relatively reliable measure which does not deviate much from a sample to another. Let's say now in that data set of, um, okay, I'll, I'll try to again use the board. We'll be using the board extensively in this session. 
Let's say in that class example, which we discussed at the beginning of the class of having uh, 50 students and their weights, I'll write down some of their weights here 45, 48, 47, again 35, 125, that extremely weight student here, 45 here, again another 50 here, 51 here, 53 here. Now let's say, if you look at the mean of this number set, hypothetically, let's say, let's say x bar will be equal to 45, like we discussed here at the beginning of the class. But what if we take values like these into different samples? I would consider a sample like this, and another sample like this. This is S1, S2. If you still calculate the X bar or mean, you will get a value close to 45. But what if you calculate values uh, like mode or uh, median? You might find different variable values depending on the sample that you are going to choose here. Okay. When your data set expanded, you could identify that. Okay, similar to uh, what we discussed here, your X bar will be pretty much coming in line with 45 or a similar value. However, if you compute other values like more than median, you might find significantly disturbed or different numbers. That is what is meant by that point. A relatively reliable measure which does not deviate much from a sample to another, from one sample to another sample. Okay. Right. So let me continue from this slide. Sir. Now, we discussed the characteristics and the usages of mode, median, and mean. Now, these are some of the advantages, disadvantages, and characteristics of mean, median, and mode. Important points. Some of these points uh, can be a bit tricky, a bit, a bit uh, tricky to understand. However, it's very important to note these characteristics. Why? Because the examination questions, especially the multiple choice questions, are tend to be focusing around the characteristics and advantages and disadvantages of mean, median, and mode, rather straightforwardly asking you to get a data set of let's say 10 numbers and why don't you calculate mean median and more okay let's go through one by one mean is a good first one first bullet point i'm reading mean is a good measure since it considers all observations of a data point compared with mode and median we discussed that what you mean by that is for, for you to compute mean you need to consider the entire data set rather by only focusing on a few data set like mode and median so you might find it a bit tricky so in computing mode and median didn't we all consider that uh, data set and uh, did the numbering and what's the difference between that and me now here you might still see instances where when you have uh, let's say open class it or frequency distributions or table or group data still if you are deriving the mean that means I, I repeat if you are deriving the mean that means you have considered the entire data set without any omitting but in more than median we discuss in classic examples like open class intervals you don't have to really calculate all the numbers or consider all the numbers rather you can omit some of the unknowns and stick to the known numbers like the example we discussed on the mode so that's what it said mean is a good measure compared to mode and median since it all observations of the data set is compared yeah, considered compared to mode and median second one mean and median are identical measure compared to mode uh, what do you mean by the word identical? That means it's a unique one single number, unlike the mode. The mode could have 
the same number representing in different instances in a given data set. In a class example like three sevens versus you come up with a mean of 17.5. 17.5 is a unique number, whereas if you look at mode, you could have multiple instances. Also. Third point, given qualitative data, mean is a meaningless measure, while mode and median are still usable in such instances. Now, this is where mean is being beaten by other two measures. Now, that triangles, circles, and squares example, those are not numbers, isn't that? So those are qualitative things like colors, green, blue, or consumer appetite, good, bad, or um, let's say dissatisfied, or, or a like cut scale from scaling your appetite towards a particular aspect from one, two, three, up to 10. Still, these are qualitative things. Now for qualitative data sets, we identify that you could still calculate values like more than median, but how do you do the calculation of mean? Could you add them together? You can't. So that is where mean is getting beaten when you consider points like qualitative data. Fourth point, but there are open classes in frequency distribution, what we discussed. Mean cannot be computed by more than median are usable. We covered that. Mean is highly influenced by extreme and skewed values while more than median are not. That's a very important characteristic. Now, in the very first example, we had two extreme values, right? Uh, 0 0.0001 and another 800 with a data set of five, sevens and eights. Now, when you calculate the mean of that data set, your mean will be 300.1 or 127.5, which might not really represent the majority of the data set. Why? Because of one outlier or one skewed data point. But whereas if you compute values like more than median still, you will find that those computations are immune from these outliers or skewed or extreme values. Okay. One before last one. Mean cannot be used as an algebraic function but more than median, sorry, mean can be used as an algebraic function, but more than median cannot be used as such. That's what I explained where when we could denote equations algebraically. One basic example would be fx equal to uh, x bar plus 5, so on and so forth. So that x bar or the mean could be taken into arithmetic equations. Can't you take more than median? That doesn't really add much value. Why? Because if you take the mode to represent your data set, that will be giving a biased data set, biased output rather, for the arithmetic equation you are going to consider. Rather, if you take the value of mean, mean is sort of like the representer or the weighted or the average number of a data set. So that will be much more suitable to use in algebraic functions. Last point, more than median can be defined graphically, but mean cannot be defined as such. So like histograms or frequency distribution tables or normal distributions, when you plot them in graphs in the upcoming lectures, you will identify that more than median could be easily defined by just looking at the tip point and the middle point. Rather, mean is a bit difficult to graphically identify. Why? because you need to look at the area under the curve to define the mean point, unlike in the graphical representation of median and mode. If I just take a moment to explain what I said. I've got an example of a normal distribution. We'll be, don't worry, we'll be learning them in the upcoming lectures. Let's say you have a frequency distribution like this. So this aspect, zero here, this is frequency. What I meant by frequency, what I meant by frequency is the amplitude or the number of occurrences or the instances where you can count these individual values are being uh, available in the data set. Let's say for the simplicity purposes, I'm going to write some numbers here. Five. 
6 upon t n. Okay. Let's assume that this is the distribution. Now this seems to be the most frequent number in this data set. Isn't that so? Why? Why do I say like that? Is because the y-axis represents the height or the number of occurrences. Let's say I denote 5 here, 6 here, and 7 here. So this means 5 value could be observed 7 times in this data set. So when you plot them graphically, you could easily identify, okay, the mode in this data set is, without any computation, mode in this data set should be 5. And depending on the symmetricalness of this data set, I could again say median must be also similar to 5. But in this example, one could argue, okay, the mean or the average will also be 5. Why? Because of the symmetric nature of the data set. But let's say if I change the pattern from this to this, what do you say? Would you say mean is the value here? You really can't. But still, you could say, now I'm going to try another number here. Let's say this is 8 and this is 3. Okay, 3 is being denoted. Now here, you could say, still, without doing any computation, the mode should be 3. So that's what I want to discuss, saying it's a relatively reliable measure. Sorry, I'm on a different slide. Mode and median can be defined graphically, but mean cannot be derived as such. Now these are some of the relative advantages and disadvantages of mode, median, and mean. Again, some theories, but let's go through one by one. Why we are doing this again to answer some of the trivial or tricky question parts at the examination categorically in MCQs. Now this slide is going to give you an examples of give you examples of why each of these measures of central tendency are good or rather what is the most frequently used instance in each of these central tendency indicators let's go through one by one when mean is useful as a good measure when data of qualitative variables are given such as mass length of objects exam marks, sales revenue, etc. Sorry, it's not qualitative, it should be quantitative. Isn't that so? And in the absence of skewed and extreme values in the data set. Now, when you have skewed and extreme values, we discuss again and again, the mean value will give you a number which might not really represent the data set. Okay? So, these are instances where mean is going to be useful. Look at the median. When median is useful as a good measure, when data of qualitative variables are given, such as consumer desires, attitudes, etc. Uh, unlike this point here, sorry about the typo here, it should be quantitative. This should be qualitative. So let's say consumer desires, you could say. Uh, uh, consumers prefer to purchase a particular good with a Likert scale of 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Or let's say 1 to 20. You could identify, okay, what is the middle value? Whether that middle value is 50 percent point. Uh, or let's say whether, uh, um, whether that 50 percent point covers at least um, majority of the consumer preferences. Or whether that 50 percent point uh, come to a variable i mean the value of that 50 percent point okay comes to a number which is below our uh, expectation that is where you can calculate the quantitativeness of a qualitative variable by just looking at the value of median second point is when a measure free from skewed and extremely extreme values is needed as an average now, when you have an extreme value, 
like the very first case of uh, the 800 value being tarnished in our data set, you could forget the mean and take mean in and mode instead of mean to represent the data set. Statistically, it's correct. Why? Because that uh, outlier data is going to hurt or that is going to tarnish the quality of the data set. So what one aspect in the advanced statistical analysis, what you could do is to, is you can identify the outlier data and statistically prove that it is an outlier data and omit that data point from the data set and then recalculate the values. So such recalculated values will have a better mean. Rather, when you can't do that, when you can't omit those values, you can still keep the mean calculated, but rather use median and mode to represent the data set. Third point, when a measure is required to show the average of a frequency distribution with open class intervals, again and again, this open class interval example could be caught up for the force or the advantages of median and mode. In the interest of time, let's quickly move through this uh, other characteristics of mode also. Mode is good when Decision should be made in abundance or no access to all the data, such as when determining a set of shoe sizes. Let's say uh, you want to, uh, in this chairs example also, similar to what we discussed, let's say we want to define a shoe size or a t-shirt size or a shirt size. You can't go and tap the entirety of your population and get their uh, shoe sizes and get their uh, you know, wrist sizes design your product. Rather, you will take a sample based on, let's say a sampling method of convenience sampling, based on the convenience, you could go to the market, talk to some people, and then get their shoe sizes and take the final decision. So you could say, I'm going to define 50% of my shoe volumes in the value of more. Let's say UK size seven or 10 and 30% at size eight, and another 30% on size six or six and a half. That is where mode is an important measure. When a decision should be made in abundance or no access to all data points. Last point, when data are highly concentrated around a particular value. In an example of uh, that class example, which we discussed at the beginning, 35 kilos is the lowest value, 125 kilos is the maximum value, while you have many students. I think I said 30 students with a value close to 45 kilograms. So you don't have to really worry about the extreme two values, rather you could take mode as a good representation. Why? Because in that example, 60% of the data is having the same number of 45 kilograms. So these are some of the places where you could identify the better sides of this each and individual three central tendency indicators. I repeat, mean, median, and mode. Okay. We are moving to the second part of our discussion. I said at the beginning of the class, we are going to discuss two aspects. One is on the central tendency. That means we identified that mean, median, and mode could be used as representatives or the indicators of a particular data set uh, instead of discussing the entirety or values like range or values like let's say quartiles rather you could calculate uh, mean median and mode and then again come to conclusions of the data set and also use that numbers in discussing or representing the data set in uh, given instances. That is the first part. The second part is we are going to discuss a factor called dispersion. Look at the definition. Dispersion can be defined as the scattering of data in a given data set. Okay, if I just use the word again. You may have seen two access histograms in some of the newspapers, articles, 
research articles. Don't worry, we'll be we'll be using these histograms in the upcoming uh, lessons. But just for the discussion purpose, let's look at some of these data points. Now, these dots that I'm going to make here will give you an indication of where these individual data points are. Since you can't see them, okay, let me just circle them also, just to give you an indication. Okay. Let's see, I'm going to put some more numbers here. What we are trying to discuss under the section on dispersion is we need to identify that in a given data set, it may be two variables or three variables with an z axis or maybe single variable, but just for the you know graphically nice computation elaboration of purposes, I just, just uh, considered a variable with two sub variables of x and y. Okay. In this given variable, these are the individual data points which you can see. Now, under dispersion, let's say if you calculate averages of x bars and y bars, means, medians, and modes, you could denote this data set in a different manner. However, you may be interested to do things like this. You may be interested to draw a line like this and say, okay, now this given data set seems to be having a trend line like this. And each of these data points are deviated from this much and that much from this given data set, from this given trend line, sorry. And this seems to be the average representative of the data set. Likewise, you could denote different interests of this data just by giving different indicators numerical values by using the section on statistics called dispersion where we are going to discuss okay let me switch back to the slides we are going to discuss how vary the given data from the derived central tendency measures extensively we will be using mean for this comparison why we identified that unlike uh, instances where qualitative data open intervals are being used mean would be the best measure to represent a given data set so let's go through this uh, text once again dispersion can be defined as scattering of data in a given data set the extent of the observations being apart from the average value of a data set is explained by the dispersion. Now, in the board example, I denoted two variables, x and y. You could comfortably um, have a single variable also. That 50 students weight example, you could say the values are hovering around 45. It is focusing around 45. Why? We denote that 45 seems to be 30 students, or so 60% of the students is having that weight of 45. So we could say that a given data point is dispersed towards 45. That is what I said, the extent of the observations being apart from the average value of the data set is being explained by the dispersion. Now we need to calculate this. We have to be mindful here. It's not an indicator like mean, median and mode, rather these are derived computations which will denote these values of what we are going to discuss in a while which shall tell you how variable these points are from a given central tendency measure. Then I reiterate, as a central tendency measure, most frequently used one is the mean, the average, the arithmetic mean. Okay. Some uses of dispersion, I'm at third bullet point. Some uses of dispersion are ability to understand how data is scattered. So when you look at a data set, you may compute mean, median, and mode. And if you just give those three numbers, mean, median, and mode of five different data sets to your audience and ask them to you know, come to conclusions, they might jump to conclusion without looking at the nature 
they are looking at the scatteredness for the pattern of the data set. Why? Because they don't know. They have been only given with the values of mean, median, and mode. Category, let's say only mean. One would say, okay, this seems to be a good mean compared to the other means. This seems to be a above average uh, mean value likewise. But still, you are lacking much more explanation statistically just by giving one variable to your audience rather you need to give more indicators to identify how your data is scattered in that given data set third point some users of the dispersion are ability to understand how data is scattered establish reliability of the measures of the average once you denote once you calculate these measures you will understand that uh, by looking at the numerical numbers of these indicators, you could say whether the data is concentrated around the mean or dispersed from the mean or away from the mean. Why do we need to know that? Because we need to make decisions. Isn't that so? If in that class example of 45 kilograms, I could come to a conclusion of, okay, I'm going to ask my... Um, contractor who is going to supply me the chairs to design the chairs to let's say mean plus 35 kilograms that means mean is uh, 45 kilograms so if i design chairs for 45 kilograms what will happen all the other students who are heavier than 45 will have problems in seating isn't that so so i'm going to denote a conclusion Okay, 45 plus another 30, that means 75 kilograms should be bearable by those chairs. What will happen to that uh, student who is having 125 kilos? Okay, I'll take a different chair. So the majority I will design by taking a decision of 45 plus 30, but five or six, I will ask him to give me uh, 45 plus 100 or 45 plus another 75. So that's why we need to identify the dispersion by and how the data are scattered from my 45 or my average or the mode or whatever the representation that I'm doing in that data set. Hmm? Comparison of scattering of data among few distributions. Now this is where it's become very interesting. When you are given a couple of distributions in life also, in a given couple of distributions or couple of data sets, you need to denote or come to conclusions. Do you know the entirety of the data set? Do you have access? Oh, no, you don't have access. Rather, just by looking at the statistical indicators like central tendency and the dispersion that we are going to discuss, you need to denote conclusions. Now, having said that, under the curriculum of what we are going to do, there are many measures of dispersion i mean statistically there could be 10 10 20 or 30 different dispersion indicators which you could discuss but these are the most used and most basic dispersion indicators which one could use in their statistical analysis first one is the range second one is the mean deviation and third and the most important ones would be variance and standard deviation we are running a little late on time due to the you know explanations and the class examples look so let's identify what these three measures of dispersion are okay range is nothing but the difference between the maximum value and the minimum value there's no computation no hard uh, formulas in this in our class example if you could recall the lighter student how many kilograms it was 35 kilograms right and the heavier student had a weight of 125 kilograms okay i'm still running on that hypothetical example so the range would be 90 kilograms let's use my calculator 125 minus 35 what you mean by the range is that the values that we are going to discuss under my data set will have a range of 90 kilograms now put that give me an indicator um, as to whether you know this is from 0 to 90 or whether could that be 1000 from 1090 it doesn't really give 
So in isolation, if you discuss the range, it doesn't really keep an indicator, but rather you need to always look at the range if you are going to cater the least value and the maximum value. Okay. So these are some of the advantages of range. It's easy to compute and, and a simple measure, just a matter of taking the calculator and taking the difference. Ability to get a brief idea of the dispersion quickly. Now in that class example, I recognize, okay, the mode of 45 kilos, but still, could I be happy? In that case, I said 60% of the students are having a weight similar to 45 kilograms or equal to 45 kilograms. Could I be happy? And can I come to a conclusion? Okay, my chairs will be, you know, wearing maximum 50 or 55 kilograms and be comfortably finish my analysis? No, I can't. Why? Because I have to look at the range also. I might find that the in that example, the weight bearability or the endurance, 35, the least point is it's a no brain. I don't want that. But how about the 125 kilos or 85 kilos? That's still I want to cater, isn't that so? So that's why, alongside with the central tendency measures, measures of dispersion like range can become very handy and are very useful. These are some of the disadvantages. It is not being a representative measure since it does not consider all observations. So let's say in the cases of our very early examples of open class intervals, where you don't know the beginning or the end due to the non-availability, still the range will be an obsolete number. If you could recall that uh, we, I had a class interval of less than five and more than eight. Can you calculate the range? No, because you don't know where the maximum number and the minimum number. So there are practical implications sometimes where you don't have the access to the maximum and minimum. In that case, range is obsolete. Last point, it only considered, it only considers the two end values of a data set. What about the middle values? It doesn't really care. It's a simple uh, indicator or a measure of dispersion you, you know how to calculate that by just by taking the difference between the maximum and the minimum. So you don't have to worry much on the usages of range. Let's come to the second one. This is what we call as the mean deviation. Look at the definition. Average value of absolute deviation from the mean to each observation on a data set is known as mean deviation. I repeat. Average value, average of absolute deviations, absolute deviations, not relative deviation, that means numerical or actual numerical num number hmm, from the mean to each observation on a data set is known as mean deviation. And for group data and ungrouped data, you could identify that this would be the equation to use. I'll explain it in the board how to uh, visually identify what we are going to discuss here, okay? Now I'm going to write a data set of, let's say, simple data set of five, seven, eight, Nine, ten. Or rather, let's say for the computational purposes, I will take all the way from five to ten. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. If I put another four also here, I could say the average or the mean should be. 7. Am I arithmetically correct? I hope so. Or we'll assume that x bar should be 7. What do you mean by this uh, uh, given example? No, I'm sorry, the given equation of xi minus x bar is that you need to take individual values you know, minus 7. 
5 minus 7. Likewise, however, there's an indicator like this. Students who have done mathematics in Sinhala, we call it as Ma Pankar. In English, we call it as a modulus. What do you mean by this is, I'll, I'll write the rest of the data points also. 7 and this one, 10 minus 7. Now, this number, if you look at the value, this is 1, this is 3. But without this modulus, this will be a negative 2. However, when you put a modulus, what you do is that you forget about the negativity and only take the numerical value of this deduction. 5 minus 7 is negative 2. Instead, get positive 2. 4 minus 7 is negative 3. Instead, get positive 3. So similarly, when you add up all these together and divide by the number of observations in this given data point is 7, will give you the answer of the mean deviation. What do you mean by the mean deviation? The mean deviation tend to give you an indication as to how your given data set is dispersed from the mean part. So in this given example, 7 is the mean and from 7, how each point are dispersed or differed or distanced. Now 7 versus 10, we know the length is 3. 7 versus uh, 4, we know the distance is again negative 3. But we forget about the negativity and we take the 3s, 3s and plus 2s and 2s and plus 1s and 1s divide by 7. We could say, let's say hypothetically that comes to 1.5. That means in average, in average, your data set is deviating from 7 plus 1.5 or minus 1.5. So when you define the mean deviation, you will only denote the positive number. Mean deviation is not being heavily used in the computation. So even if you look at the examination questions, this is not a categorically questioned uh, value to be computed, but it's important to understand that Almost all the deviations that we are going to discuss from this point onwards is having the same concept of individual value minus the average is to be taken into consideration when you denote the distance. So what if you take this uh, square value of this xi minus x bar square, then this concept of modulus doesn't really be needed by even a positive number square or a negative number square will be the positive number always. But when you merely look at the numerical value of deviation from the mean, you need to always take the modulus or the non-negativity of the deviation and divide by the number of observation to come to the mean deviation value. The second equation, just for the comp completion sake of the notes only, I have given it. When you have frequency intervals, what all but two, the difference would be instead of the uh, individual numbers, you may have group data with open intervals or close intervals. For those group data, you need to multiply that by the group frequency from 10 to 20. Let's say you have seven number of data. So from 10 to 20, you may take 15 as the representation. 15 minus your uh, mean multiplied by 7. Why? Because that you have grouped the data instead of taking the absolute data one by one. Again, uh, for the completion sake, only I've given the equation for the uh, group data. Most of the time, we'll be using for the ungrouped data or the raw data or the absolute data, which will be the top equation. You have to keep this in mind. I would say not this one, but the equations uh, that will follow from this point. Okay. Quickly, let's brush through these things also. So, 
what are these advantages of mean deviation? First one, good representation of measure since all observations are taken into account. This repeats. Second point, re-establish the mean since the deviation from the mean to each data point is easily is evaluated separately. Uh, once again, uh, what this says is that when you derive the value of mean, each deviation from the mean will be taken into consideration uh, and that number, let's say 7 plus or minus 5 or 1000 plus or minus 50 will give you an indicator of how each value is close to the uh, mean in an average, again in an average. So it will again reiterate or re-establish the position of the mean by means of adding one more number, mean plus mean deviation. 7 plus 7, 7 plus 1.5 okay that's what i said in the second point disadvantages not a good algebraic measure since only absolute values of the deviations are considered um, when you look at the algebraic point of view we said just for the computation purposes we are taking the modulus numbers or the non-negative numbers but algebraically if your data set is uh, denoting let's say negative values mean deviation is not the thing to use but standard deviation and variation which will be following these other indicators now this is the pivotal point of today's discussion where we are introducing the most two common indicators of statistical data of uh, dispersion indicators that is the standard deviation and Variance. Variance is derived by calculating the average values of the squares of mean deviation. We discussed this a little while ago. So, so instead of xi minus x bars, we will take xi minus x bars square value. Why do we do that? We will see once we come to the standard deviation and mean computations. So again, I reiterate variance is derived by simply calculating the average values of the squares of mean deviations. Standard deviation is nothing but the square root of that computed value. A student is important to understand. Once we take the uh, squares of a particular value, let's say 7 minus 3 into square root, that's good, square. 7 minus 3 would be 4, 4 into uh, 4 square would be 16, right? Now, once you have those numbers on 16, 25, 9, likewise, you are computing a data set which has a different set of faces or planes. Your data set lying between 7, 8, and 9, whereas your Variance data is lying between 9, 16, 25 by those deviations are being squared. Now, instead of taking the variance for computational uh, indications, what we have to do is in that instance take the square root whereby denoting the true representation of this version from the central data point. Let's say from the mean, you take the uh, that example mean of 7, you take uh, 7 minus 3, take the square, you see that the equation, don't worry, you take the square and then add all those squares, divide by n, and from that value you have to take the square root, why? Because then again from that phase or the plane, you are again deriving back to the same plane of data which we had originally derived our uh, variances from. These, denot uh, these uh, indicators are important to keep an eye on and we'll be throughout this lecture series uh, using these indicators um, across and uh, these are again standard indicators or uh, identifier for statistical indicators of variance and standard deviation. The only difference would be we need to understand the two buckets of population and sample. 
90% of the time we'll be discussing about the sample. However, if at all we are to discuss on the entire population, that of course has a different indicator. I'm coming to the bottom part of the slide where I need to define the variance of the sample will be denoted by S square. Y square, because we have taken the square values. And when you come to the standard deviation only, you have this nice indicator of capital S being denoted as the representative. So the standard, if, if I rephrase it, standard deviation denoted by S, and if standard deviation is S, we discussed a moment ago, variance is the square of the standard deviation. The other side, we define the standard deviation as a square root. So if that is the case, then the variance should be the square of standard deviation. So if ST is denoted by S, then easily variance will be the S square. So similar to these two indicators of S and capital S and capital S square to denote the standard deviation and variance, for the population, we use the sigma. So that sigma, which you see here uh, in the beginning of the uh, discussion where we have from i from 1 to n that's also a sigma but this notation also you could identify as sigma so whenever we discuss the population standard deviation or population variance instead of capital s we could use the notation of sigma as shown here okay having said that let's look at the different to the equation that we are going to make here. If you could recall the mean deviation, we had xi minus x bar divided by n. Okay. So the same form, no worry much. Look at the look at the form that we are uh, representing here. The same form is being replaced by a square. That's all. Nothing much. I repeat, the mean deviation, we have taken the squares to come to the variance and standard deviations equation. Now, this equation, you have to keep in mind, make a note. Uh, forget about the group data. I just said for the completion sake only, I'm always representing the uh, uh, this, uh, capital F. I'm sorry, the simple f for the frequency uh, of the particular table or a group, but the one group data, this would be the equation. So we have taken the xi minus x bar to the square and divide by n number of uh, instances for the variance. And if it's the standard deviation that we are going to discuss, pretty simple, what we have to do is that for this particular value, take the square root. Right. Now, this is the addition of slide which I have uh, added for the clarity purpose and for the compute, uh, completeness purpose, slide number 17. Now if you could recall, I have highlighted as population here because this capital N has been denoted in both of these equations. So let's forget about this group data um, for the for the moment and focus on the population versus sample. Now this is where at the beginning of the class I said sometimes when you denote values like mean for the population and sample you will still divide the same by number of items. Um, that's a capital N for the population and simple N for the sample. So the sample mean and population mean will have the same um, value that will be divided by capital N or simple N. But if you look at carefully, the only difference of the population and sample equation would be for, for the sample instead of capital, uh, oh, oh, for the discussion purpose, let's say this is N, this capital and simple, we'll forget it for the moment. So instead of dividing it by N, what you have to do is always divide it by n minus 1. Now, this is a topic where we can spend 
at least a half an hour and discuss on degrees of freedom and why this n minus one is coming and why it is not n minus two or why it is n plus one. But statistically, it is proven for your sample to have a better variance value and a better standard deviation value. You need to instead of divide by the total number of observations, you have to divide it by that observation minus one. So students, why I have highlighted this in red is that all the given equations in the, oh, sorry, all the given questions in the examination, you will be invited to compute, let's say variance or standard deviation that implies we are looking at a sample. Who it might, uh, or, or a question might say, let's say um, we need to define the maximum variance or minimum number of occurrence or what is the highest variation or what is in plain English, what is the highest standard deviation? So that could be the leading questions you might see in the examination paper without indicating, not only at this examination, but in any statistical data, without indicating whether we are looking at the sample or population. So in statistics, unless it is mentioned population, we are always looking at sample. So that is why, again, I have highlighted this section in, in a small red box here for you to remember only this equation. And always, if the same, if the same equation being um, asked to you know, rephrase it for the population, what you have to do is simply, instead of n minus 1, divide it by n population, whether it be population or whether it be sample. Okay. I reiterate, I mean, there are a couple of equations from this slide to this slide, but if I just merely simplify it, this all these equations are stemming from this mean deviation point. I reiterate for the clarity, you can take the deduction of individual value by the mean, take the modulus, divide by n to come for the mean deviation. So instead of taking the modulus value, there's another way to calculate the mean, uh, I'm sorry, to calculate the variance and standard deviation. What we do is, instead of the modulus, we take the square. And if it is on the square form, we are looking at the variance. And if it is on the uh, square root form, that is the standard deviation. So all these equations are exactly in the similar form instead of their square roots or the squares or the denotions from the populations to the sample or the denotion from the group data to the ungrouped data. Same equation, marginally modifying for the usage. Okay. We have a class example here. Uh, I have that in my laptop. Let me just quickly pop it up. Yeah. Calculate the S square and S for the following data set. It's a plain vanilla x variable data set of 3, 7, 13, up to 10. How many observations you have here? I think you have 10 observations. Isn't that so? Yeah. So by, I mean, by using Excel, you can easily do it. So let's discuss the data, uh, the steps that you are going to uh, use at the examination, if at all, examiner wants to test your knowledge just by giving a data set and compute the values. Okay. I hope you have a, a calculator in your position. I'm sure you can easily calculate the same in Excel. However, I reiterated that uh, it's always used. It's always better to, you know, get familiar yourself with a calculator at the beginning of the class. Because once you're close to the examination, you must be very comfortable with the numbers. Okay. Um, I have the class example here. You have the values of 30, 7, 13, 21, and up until 10. Could, could you uh, identify the mean for this data set? Am 
what you have to do simply is take the sigma x i divided by n. Okay. So the total of my class example is 260. I suggest you do the calculation with me. Um, so you, you have uh, 260 divided by 10. This will give you the value of 26 as x bar. Why do we need x bar in the first place? Is why? Because we are going to calculate the variance and standard deviation. Now each of these data points should be divided, I'm sorry, deducted with 26 and take the square for the computation. The next step would be, you can easily write down these data points here, 7, 13, and compute the x i minus x bar value here. Okay, so the first one, 30 minus 26 would be 4. And follow me. Okay. 7 minus 26 will be negative 19. 13 minus 26 will be negative 13. So, similarly, you could denote the rest of the values. And the immediate next step would be to take the, let me just erase them. Immediate next step would be to take the xi minus x bar square. Okay. So you have 16 and so on and so forth. So what does the equation say? Let's quickly switch back to our calculation. So what we have came across so far is we have taken the xi minus x bar, taken the square. Assuming this is the sample, you could divide by n minus 1. But here, for the computational purpose, let's say I'm going to say this is population. In that case, you have to divide it by 10. So now what you have to do is, you have to take the total of this, and the calculation here, 1064, I hope you can see it, yeah. And then either divide it by 10 or 9, depending on the population or Sample. So for the computation purpose, I'll give you the answer. If it is a sample, you should get a uh, standard deviation of 21.25. Yeah, that's the answer. Try it at home. I mean, one would, method would be you can try out in the Excel, but I really suggest you take a calculator write the equation in a piece of paper, take the accumulation values and uh, try to square it, add it up and take the square root. Okay. Also, let me suggest a shortcut also. I, uh, I discussed that at the beginning of the class that you can take scientific calculators like this one I'm showing here, Casio FX 991ES plus, where there are some shortcuts you can easily use. Now, these calculators have modes like statistical uh, analysis modes. So you can easily convert the mode into uh, statistics mode. I say the data mode. And then easily you can ins insert each and individual. I'll try to be a little bit closer. So you have 30 here. You have 7 here. You have 13 here. Likewise, you can plot the rest of the data points. And once you enter those data points, now mind you, these are not programming. Programming is something somewhat different, where you can uh, program treasury bond computations likewise. This is merely using a statistics uh, mode in a calculator. So once you enter the data points, you can come to indicators like sum, for example. Let's say if I want to get the summation of individual data points, you get 260. Let's say you want to get the summation of uh, individual data points square, again, there's another indicator, likewise. I'm looking at variance, isn't that so? So I came to this point of shift stat, um, variance, item number four here, then I have the value of uh, sigma x and sx. Now, I just put the 
by Tamant. Let me close it up. You see under indicator number three and four, you see sigma x and sx. So if I want sigma x, I would just type as three, then I get 20.15. And if I want the other one for the population, I could use sx. It will give me a value of 21.249, which I have brought it down. So remember, you have three methods. In your real life, you don't have to worry much. You can just take the Excel. And um, there, there may be equations also, just to get a uh, you know standard deviation variation. You just write a data set, and then write equals var or equals SD. Then Excel will do the computation. Second method would be use a calculator at the examination. Sometimes you might find it a bit uncomfortable uh, to you know multiply 10 numbers and take the roots and squares and uh, do a computation, you might uh, miss important marks. Um, but still, uh, you could use the calculator statistics mode. Most of the scientific calculations have those modes. So I suggest you, um, you know, get yourself familiarized with your calculator's statistics mode. Third and the hardest mode would be, you can write it down in a piece of paper easily, um, you know, um, add it one by one and compute. So those would be the methods to calculate the population and standard deviation. Sorry, I misspelled, not population and standard deviation, variance and standard deviation. Sorry about that. Right. So we're running a little late today on time, but for the completion sake, I only have one theoretical area. And I bought a lot of examination questions. Unfortunately, I think we may have to shift it for the second class. Um, so let's finish off the theory part and let's just uh, take a five minutes of your precious time and walk through the examination questions and uh, you know discuss it in the next class since because we are running out of time. Lastly, under the measures of dispersion, let's look at individual uh, usages of variance and standard deviation. And now we have to be careful. Now these are absolute measures, absolute numbers. Okay. There again, we might find sometimes these absolute measures will be giving again misleading indicators. Now, all what we are trying to do is to better our data set, isn't that so? Better, uh, I mean, give a better output to our data set representators, measures of central tendency, measures of dispersion. But still, it might not be the uh, case when we look at some of the examples towards the last part. So, before that, these are some of the usages, so uh, practical aspects of variance and standard deviation. Let's look at one by one. Since all data are used in deriving variance and standard deviations, they are good representative measures, similar to our mean example. Extent of each observation derived from mean is taken into account. Of course, that's what we did. So each and individual data points observation is being computed. Now, unlike taking the individual data points value, what we have done is taken a deviation value for the measure of central dispersion, measure of dispersion, okay? Third point, taking square of the real deviation, unlike absolute deviation, to avoid mean deviation being zero, this measure is mathematically accurate. Now, I'll come to an interesting part. If you look at that example of one, two, three, four, five, and I discussed that uh, we're taking the modulus values and we are going to take the positive numbers. What if you have taken the negative numbers here? Instead of seven minus five positive, eight minus five positive. Now, on the other side, we took three minus five, negative two. Is that the value we take? No. Instead of negative two, we took positive two and divide by five we came to 1.5 or 1.6. But if instead of taking the mean deviation values without modulus, what will happen is that always it will come to a value of zero. So that is why we took the modulus when we're discussing the mean deviation. So variance and standard deviation gave an answer to that problem of uh, getting the mean deviation being zero. We could still take the negative values, but when we take the square value, automatically 
irrespective of whether it's a positive number or a negative number, it becomes a positive number. Fourth point, deviations are over evaluated in variance, but standard deviation takes out that weakness. We could identify that. We are discussing a data, a data plane of sevens and eights and nines, whereas the variation values will be nines and sixteens and twenty fives and thirty six so on and so forth. But there are different uses of variance and mean, uh, variance and standard deviation, where you are going to uh, discuss at the next class and at the questions also. Last point, standard deviation is the best measure of absolute deviation to compare different distribution with the same unit or similar means. That means when you have been given that example of 50 students weight to define the uh, uh, weight variability or the endurance of a chair, you may jolly well get 10 more classes of 50 students and 40 students so on and so forth. Okay. Those classes will have a approximately similar mean with a similar distribution of weights. So again, when you want to get the means of, let's say five different classes, you might have 45 and another class of 47 and another class of 43. But what if some classes are having absolutely dispersed data compared to our class? Our class has 60% of the student, students with a population of 45, sorry, with a weight of 45 kilograms. But if there's another class, only three students, one having a value of 45, the other is 80 and the next person is 30. Still, when you calculate variance and standard deviation alongside with the mean, your values will be giving a much more clear representation on different classes. So that, that's the last point, what, what it tried to denote, that it is the best measure to measure of absolute deviation to compare different distributions, different classes with same units or similar means. Having said that, we are coming to the last theoretical part of the session, that is the coefficient of variation. Though using these measures of absolute dispersion to compare variations of distributions, data set with different units and significantly different means shall derive wrong conclusions. I repeat, although we use these absolute numbers, say mean of 7 plus 1, 7 minus 2, although we use these absolute measures, if we are trying to compare data set with different units and significantly different means, let's say my data set has a mean of 7 and the other data set has a mean of 1007, then we can't come to conclusions just by you know looking at the nature of this central tendency or the variations rather we will take both and derive a relative measure which we will call it as the coefficient of variation it is nothing but the ratio of standard deviation to the mean look at this equation given here in red color this is something which you have to uh, take note and keep in mind for a given data set you have a standard deviation which we computed a moment ago and we will take that as a fraction or a percentage of its mean value i want to capture this point also measure of relative dispersion relative percentage can be used to compare such distributions and confident coefficient of variation can be used in such instances so i recap we could calculate the variance and standard deviation. However, when we are doing multiple comparisons, it's always better to use this relative measure, which we call it as the coefficient of variation. This is how it is being defined in statistics. Lastly, I want to discuss two class examples. I'm really terribly sorry today because of the explanations I'm bit running out of time, but merely for the completion's sake, Let's just go through these two class examples. Let me switch back to the slides. This is an addition to your distributor slides, by the way. 
look at this class example. Calculate the coefficient of variation for below two data sets and interpret the results. We'll be starting the next week's class with this uh, before the next theory set. Uh, but for the completion sake, I just want to uh, indicate what I want to meant by here. Okay, you have the first data set of x data having values of 1, 2, and 3, y data of 101, 102, and 103. Okay. We'll take this only that example. The, the other one we will leave it for the next class. So what I want to discuss here is you have values of one, two, and three here. What would be the x bar? It would be two. In the other data set, you have the values of 101, 102, and 103. Value of y bar would be 102. So how do I do it without you know calculating? It's pretty easy. You, know, you add everything and divide by three, it should come to the middle value. Okay. Um if you look at if you calculate the standard deviation for x and standard deviation for y, you will get the same ones of one. Take a moment, uh, take out your you know, calculators and try to do this calculator for standard deviation. Um, what it statistically says is that how deviated these points are from the mean, isn't that so? So you have two here, three is deviated one, and two, one is deviated again one. So that's the indicator that will be computed using this complex equation. It could be the same for this example where you will have 102, 103, and 101, you will again get the same standard deviation. Why? Because each of these data points are deviated only one from the mean. But if you calculate the coefficient of variance, co coefficient of variation, the x and the coefficient of variation for the y, you will have two different values. That will only indicate how these data points are being deviated or relatively deviated from each other from data set x to data set y okay so since i want to take another five minutes of your time uh, for the examination question discussion also let me stop the theory part from here and i invite you to take a note or a screenshot of these two examples which will be starting the discussion from the next class where the first example was the one that we discussed x of 1 2 3 and y of 101 102 and 103 and the second example what i want to discuss is a more practical example of fuel prices of country a versus country b so these values of 2.7 up until 2.71 to 11612 to 12084 will be your data set Take a moment of your time, calculate the um, uh, means and the variance and then the coefficient of variance. We'll keep the discussion for the next class. And before we wind up, um, I just want to take a um, quick moment to give you what will be the questionable areas uh, in your examination. Okay. So categorically, there are a lot of questions in question number one. So I hope you could see the slides. So for the completion sake, let me just uh, give you the question numbers for you to give it a give it an attempt. I iterate. Once we finish the next theory class, we'll be taking a whole class to discuss maybe the entirety of these questions. Okay. 2019 September. Now all these questions are coming from question number one, compulsory question. Okay. Let me quickly give you these numbers. 2019 September. Question number one, part number three, part number four, part number five, and part number six. Now you could see that there are four questions, that means eight marks coming in this most recent paper. Okay, 2019 September. We are moving to the second paper, 2019 March. We have question number three and question number 
5. You please keep a note. 2018 September, we have question number 5. Question number 6. 2018 March, again question number 2. 2017 September, question number 1. And question number 7. 2017 March, question number 3. Question number 7. 2016 September, question number 2. And question number 3. Question number 6. 2016 March, question number 2. Question number 3. And question number 6. That's all. Um, there are plenty of uh, examination questions uh, categorically coming from question number one of your compulsory question. Um, again, once we finish the theory part of the next class, where we'll be categorically focusing on uh, a few more measures on central dispersed and the uh, variance, there you will be able to answer the full questions of 20 marks. So we will be try to have a full class on the examination questions because since you can score some easy marks out of this section okay sorry for the extra minutes that i've taken from your time i hope today's class is clear and let's carry forward the questions to the next class okay and in case if you don't have a, more questions to be discussed right now have a good evening